everyone, and welcome to today's show, Building a Complete American Neighborhood Profiling Atlanta, Georgia, brought to you by City Age in collaboration with Reimagine America's Schools and the Siegel Fam Family Endowment. Atlanta leaders, along with leaders from across the country, are here today to show us how they're building a new livability around their communities, schools, and emerging leadership in tech. We want this event to be interactive, so the first thing we're going to do today is ask our audience a question. The question is gonna pop on your screen right now, and you'll have a selection of choices from them. The question is, why is the relationship between schools and their surrounding neighborhoods important? You've got five options. Feel free to make your selection below. Now, while we wait for those results to come in, we're gonna go ahead and, um, uh, give you a couple of uh, more information regarding our programming. I'll start by kicking us off and introducing myself. My name is Selma Shalbaya. I'm a former CNN journalist, a current communication professor at Clayton State University, and the founder of Shalbaya Consulting, a communication firm focused on compelling and creative storytelling. And I am delighted to be your anchor for this City Age episode. Our audience is filled with leaders from 18 different states from here in the US and seven different countries from around the world. It's wonderful to see that although we're profiling Atlanta, this is truly a global conversation. Now, before we get started, a few quick notes about the comments section. When you comment in the chat section, make sure to direct your comments to everyone. This way we can all see your comments and help everyone remain engaged. Plus, we'd love to read them throughout the program. You'll need to update this as your default settings direct messages just to panelists. So you're going to want to change that so that everyone can see your comments. For more specific questions, please use the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen to ask questions to the speakers and panelists throughout the sessions. Again, questions are to be submitted through the Q&A section because we don't wanna miss them in the chat. Please note that live transcription is also available. You can select the CC live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom section to activate it. Now, we mentioned that we want to make this event as interactive as possible. So everyone can take a moment right now and tell us your name and where you're Zooming from. Like for example, I said earlier, I'm Selma and I'm Zooming from Atlanta, Georgia. Now let's check out the results from the last question that you just took. Here are the results rolling in. And I love to see that everyone is agreeing that there is several relationships here between schools and surrounding neighborhoods. It looks like most folks said all of the above to provide new learning opportunities and outside traditional classrooms and opportunities for everyone who lives in the neighborhood and more energized neighborhoods, as well as open new funding opportunities to build schools for the future. We're all in agreement there. Now, here's another question that I'm gonna ask you before we kick off. The question is, how important is it to think of the school and its neighborhood as an integrated ecosystem? Feel free to make your selection from the choices you see in front of you on the screen. Now, while the results are gonna come in, let's get started with the program. Ron Bogle is going to kick us off. Um, he brings decades of experience from the world of architecture, education, and philanthropy as co-founder and CEO of Reimagine America Schools. With core funding from Schmidt's Futures, Ron is, a le is leading a national initiative to bring together thought leaders from education, technology, design and civic community to rethink public education and the built environment of America's schools. Please help me welcome Ron Bogle. And Ron, you so it's all yours. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, we are really thrilled to be in Atlanta, even though I'm actually sitting on my stool in New York, uh, but we're there in spirit, certainly. And we're excited about um, the conversation starting today. As some have said, Reimagine America Schools was initially funded with a Catalyst grant from Schmidt Futures. And we're very excited now that a Siegel Family Endowment uh, has joined us as a partner, but also as a funder. Um, why are we here? Reimagine America Schools and the Siegel Family Endowment, along with our partners at City Age, are in Atlanta to work with leaders in Georgia 
to reflect on the challenges faced by our schools and communities, but also to consider possible new strategies for building the complete American neighborhood that's based on equity, community, education, and opportunity. We all know this, but for decades, federal, state, and local governments have created program after program to renew marginalized communities. At the same time, countless strategies have been attempted to improve our public schools, schools that are often underperforming and that reside in those very same neighborhoods. But all too often, these efforts result in little improvement or have often made things worse, either by neglect or too often by design. Historically, these renewal and improvement initiatives have operated on separate and uncoordinated tracks. One set of efforts for the neighborhood renewal, another set of efforts to improve transportation, and yet another unrelated set of efforts for school improvement. Most often, this disjointed and disconnected approach has resulted in a status quo in many neighborhoods that is unsustainable. This is especially true in schools and communities of color where stark inequities have been laid bare by COVID-19. And few would argue that the existing conditions in these neighborhoods and in these schools are acceptable. There seems to be a growing sense emerging from our experience with the pandemic that new strategies must be created and implemented in order to make the changes needed in our schools and in our communities. And if there's a silver bullet or silver lining, I should say, from COVID-19, maybe it is that it serves as a wake-up call that we must do better for our fellow citizens and for our future generations. But often it is our governance structures within cities that hold us back and has resulted in decision-making that almost seems to view the community as a collection of disparate pieces rather than an integrated ecosystem. Despite the lessons we are learning from the pandemic, going back to doing things the old ways will have an overwhelming appeal. First, it's what we know. And second, because it's possible that new ways of doing things just haven't been invented, haven't been created. And that's what we're here to do today. Reimagine America's Schools is a not-for-profit, non-transactional organization. And our leadership team has worked with cities and schools for almost 15 years, using design and design thinking as tools to engage leaders and citizens to disrupt the typical decision-making process and to support community efforts to create a new vision for their future, for their neighborhood, for their school. During the pandemic, we put our community-based work on pause and spent the past 18 months exploring the changes that must occur in order to lift opportunity for black and brown students in our public schools, and at the same time, engage the entire community so that a singular vision can blossom with education at the center and education as the driving force for positive change. We're calling this working concept education-centered community reinvestment which is a fully integrated approach. And we borrow from our partners at Siegel and their framework for incorporating physical, digital, and social infrastructure. The concept includes bits and pieces of the placemaking movement, the 15 minute city, a community school movement, new uses for technology and new models for collaboration. To achieve this, strategy, the politics and policies and practices that often block collective planning must be changed. So it seems to us that this is a pretty intuitive idea. I mean, what's wrong with working together? So the question might not be so much, what are we trying to do, as it is, how do we do it? And exploring the how-to question is why we're in Atlanta today. Atlanta is our first such engage, engagement to co-create a roadmap for city, civic, and education leaders that relies on actionable strategies to create a singular plan for addressing 
decades old challenges. But today is just the start of our work here. In the next months, we will begin a process to identify and select one or two change ready school and neighborhood pairings in Georgia to bring our community engagement and design workshop program to. And we certainly hope one of those will be the Atlanta Public Schools. More, <clears throat> excuse me, more information on Reimagine America Schools is in the chat room. Uh, please let us know if you'd like to know, please let us know if you'd like to know more. And now let's get on with our program. A conversation between An Andrew Feiler and Ted Landsmark. Um, a brief introduction. Andrew Feiler is an author. Uh, he wrote A Better Life for Their Children, Julius Rosenwald's Booker T. Washington, and the 4,978 Schools That Changed America. He is a fifth generation Georgian and has long been active in civic life. He has helped create over a dozen community initiatives, serves on multiple not for profit boards, and is an active advisor to numerous elected officials and political candidates. Ted Landsmark is a distinguished professor and director of the Kitty and Michael Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy at Northeastern University in Boston. He has a bachelor's, a master's, and a law degree from Yale and a PhD from Boston College. He's kind of a smart guy. Uh, he's a visionary leader and teacher in diversity and design, environmental design, community-based economic development, public policy, historic preservation, African-American art, and he is also an advisor to us at Reimagine America Schools. We'll start off with a few words from Dr. Landsmark, followed by a brief presentation by Mr. Feiler, and then concluding with a conversation between Ted and Andrew. Ted, the floor is yours. Well, thanks a lot, Ron. And uh, I want to start by welcoming um, all of the participants to this conversation. Uh, a year and a half ago now, I was asked uh, by folks at FEMA uh, to undertake some research uh, into how our schools could better serve our communities in a post-COVID era. Uh, it's clear that there will be infrastructure investments that will be made all across the country in both urban and rural schools uh, to uh, really begin to implement uh, some of the learnings that we've picked up from COVID, uh, the sense of isolation uh, that uh, communities and parents sometimes feel from their schools uh, has been uh, exacerbated uh, by the pandemic. And uh, what we've seen is that there are gross disparities uh, in terms of learning outcomes and school engagement um, across our communities, particularly around issues of race. Um, we all know that it's time for change. Uh, in terms of the way we educate our children to uh, enter into uh, the marketplace and to be civically engaged. The question is, how do we make those changes take place? And my expectation is that part of what we'll talk about uh, today with a strong focus um, on public schools um, is what can we do to really implement change? Um, there are many, many ideas on the table, some of which derive from the design community, uh, some of which uh, result from uh, analyses done by cultural anthropologists, some uh, have come up from people involved in healthcare uh, and community outreach and community engagement. Um, and there isn't yet really a consensus other than that we need to do better. Uh, particularly engaging communities and particularly in transforming the way our school facilities uh, provide more of a range of services than they do at this moment. Um, and so I'm uh, looking forward to uh, a dialogue that will take us both back in time uh, to the Rosenwald schools, which helped to uh, transform education, uh, particularly for African-Americans uh, across the South uh, just a century ago. Um, and I'm looking forward to an engaged conversation that really does focus on the challenges that we face 
uh, both in our big cities and in uh, some of our more rural communities. So um, I want to open with that and uh, then uh, bring Andrew into the conversation for uh, the um, precipitation really of, of, a, of a conversation about how the past can inform what we do now and what we're going to be uh, able to do into the future with public education. So Andrew, you're on. Great, thank you, Ted. Um, it's great to join you and it's great to join you all in this conversation. Uh, I am going to share my screen here. And there we go. So I'm gonna start with a simple premise. The Rosenwald Schools program is one of the most transformative developments in the first half of the 20th century. It dramatically transforms America. It dramatically transforms the African-American experience, and yet it remains hidden history and its scope and sweep is largely unknown. This is a portrait of Julius Rosenwald that hangs on the wall of the Noble Hill School in Bartow County, Georgia. That's about an hour up I-75 from downtown Atlanta. Julius Rosenwald was born to Jewish immigrants who had fled religious persecution in Germany. He grows up in Springfield, Illinois, across the street from Abraham Lincoln's home. He rises to become the president of Sears Roebuck and Company and leads the company from 1908 until his death in 1932. And he becomes one of the earliest and greatest philanthropists in American history. And his, and his cause is what later becomes known as civil rights. This is a portrait of Booker T. Washington that hangs above the mantle of the president's home with what is now Tuskegee University. Booker T. Washington was born into slavery in Virginia. He attends Hampton College, he becomes an educator, and he's the founding principal of the historically black college uh, in Alabama, uh, originally known as uh, Tuskegee Institute. And this is a rare portrait of the two men together, printed on fabric and sewn into, into a quilt to commemorate the restoration of the Pine Grove School in Richland County, South Carolina. And at the rededication ceremony, Former students and former teachers were invited to sign the quilt and it hangs today in the restored schoolhouse. These two men meet in 1911. That's 110 years ago this year. We have to remember 1911 is before the Great Migration, which doesn't begin until later that decade. So 90% of African Americans live in the South. And public schools for African Americans are mostly shacks with a fraction of the funding provided for the education of white children. And many jurisdictions do not even have public schools for African-Americans. And so the two men create this program that becomes known as Rosenwald Schools. They reach out to the black communities of the South. And this is a portrait of students and teachers in front of the, what becomes the Jefferson Jacobs School. This is in the 1920s in Eastern Kentucky. They reach out to the black communities of the South and they say, if you will contribute to a school because we want you to be a full partner in your progress. And if you will reach out to the school board, the white school board, because we want to deliberately establish black white dialogue as a foundation for future progress. And these have to be public schools. While we welcome the school board's contribution, at a minimum, they have to agree to own, maintain, and staff the school, pay for the teachers. If you do those two things, Julius Rosenwald will make a substantial contribution towards school construction. I wanna think, think about this for just a second. There is genius in this design. The black community has to contribute. This is one of the earliest examples of challenge grants in American history. The white school board has to participate. This is one of the earliest examples of public-private partnership in American history. And this program begins in 1912, when the Lochapoca community in Lee County, Alabama, becomes the first community to achieve the match to fund a Rosenwald School from 1912 until 1937, when President Roosevelt presides over the dedication of the last Rosenwald School, the Eleanor Roosevelt School in Meriwether County, Georgia. From 1912 to 1937, this program builds 
4,978 schools across 15 southern and border states. And the results are transformative. There are two economists from the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago who have done five studies of Rosenwald schools. What their data shows is that there was a large and persistent black-white education gap in the South prior to World War I. That gap closes precipitously between World War I and World War II. And the single greatest driver of that achievement, and it is an achievement, is Rosenwald schools. In addition, many of the leaders and foot soldiers of the civil rights movement to come come through these schools. Medgar Evers, Maya Angelou, multiple members of the Little Rock Nine who integrated Little Rock Central High School, and Congressman John Lewis all went to Rosenwald schools. Congressman Lewis wrote this extraordinary introduction to my book, and I just want to set some context here. This is uh, the Emory School, the oldest surviving Rosenwald School in Hale County, Alabama, uh, built in 19, around 1915. I had never heard of Rosenwald schools until 20, February of 2015, and I found myself at lunch with a woman named Jeannie Syriac, who originated the role of African-American heritage specialist at the Georgia State Historic Preservation Office, and the story shocked me. I'm a fifth generation Jewish Georgian. I've been a progressive activist my entire life. How could I have never heard of Rosenwald schools? And the pillars of the story are the pillars of my life. And so I went back, uh, I came home and I Googled Rosenwald schools. And I found that while there were a number of um, books on the academic books on the topic, there was not a comprehensive photographic account of the program. And so over the next three and a half years, I drove 25,000 miles across all 15 program states uh, of the original 4,978 schools, about 500 survive. Um, about only half of those have been restored. Uh, and I shot 105 of those schools. Uh, the book of this work uh, was uh, just published earlier this year. It, it is in photographic terms a bestseller. It's in its third printing. I'll put a link in the chat to the book. There's an exhibition of this work currently up at the Center for Civil and Human Rights of Atlanta, but in Atlanta, but it comes down December 19th and it will travel uh, to uh, a number of major cities, Charlotte, uh, Memphis, Richmond, uh, New Orleans, uh, uh, Richmond. Uh, I'll put a, a link in the chat to the exhibition schedule as well. Uh, but what I wanna talk about now is the architectural idiom of the school. I'm gonna bring you inside the uh, Emory School because this is an early example. This is progressive era architecture in service to education. Uh, the, the original designs of this program were laid out by Robert Robinson Taylor and a team of architects at, at, at uh, Tuskegee. Uh, Robert Robinson Taylor was the first African-American to attend MIT, the first accredited African-American architect. Uh, and he, um, uh, he and his team, he was the chief architect at Tuskegee. The architecture of this program, it begins with large windows on the left here uh, to let in lots of light because these schools didn't originally have electricity. On the, on the uh, that was on, that's on the left. On the right, these uh, cloakrooms so the dirty outer garments could be kept uh, out of the school spaces. Uh, and this room divider you see in the back, that originally had a set of doors that could be closed off to separate these education spaces or accordioned back to, um, to open up uh, the space so it could be used as a community center after education hours. Uh, this is, that is what was known as a one teacher school. This is a two teacher school, the Hope School in Newberry County, South Carolina. Uh, this was uh, this is named after James Hope, who was the state school superintendent in South Carolina, who was so committed to this program uh, that he donated the land to the school, uh, for this school, and every county in South Carolina had Rosenwald schools. To give you an example of, the, of how the density of these schools, there, if you take out Missouri, which joined the program late and only had uh, uh, three schools, only one of which survives today, the remaining 14 uh, states in the program, two thirds of all counties have Rosenwald schools. 80 of, of, Af of counties that had actually had African-American school aged children, 85% of those counties have Rosenwald schools. And many of them had a large number of schools, 
and this is in Newberry County. Newberry County had 26 Rosenwald schools. In fact, across all of South Carolina, the average county had 10 Rosenwald schools. And the reason for that is that the African-American community was not afforded school buses. And so they had to have smaller schools that they could walk to. In fact, John Lewis, in, their in, in this introduction to my book, talks about the bus carrying the white children, passing him as he walked to school. The last thing I'll say about this schoolhouse is that if you go to the, the, the National Museum of African American History and Culture today, you will find in that museum from this schoolhouse, six schoolhouse desks, one potbelly stove, and the original sign proclaiming Hope School. Uh, this is a three teacher school. The design uh, uh, idiom of the Rosenwald Schools program was that the architecture was to be modest. Uh, and that was really for two reasons. One was to save cost, and the other was to prevent um, the ire of the African-American community, uh, backlash, if you will, otherwise known as arson. Uh, and yet this school has a cupola. In fact, cupolas were expressly forbidden uh, in the architectural um, program of the Rosenwald schools because one of its uh, one of the architects that was behind the design of the program believed that cupolas were reflective of church architecture and therefore violated the separation of church and state. But, what you, but remember, the African-American community has to contribute. And, that, and they counted in that contribution cash, land, material, or labor. What you see here is African-American community agency. The community wanted a cupola and they built a cupola. Now, these schools that I've shown you so far, these one, two, and three store, uh, uh, one, two, three teacher schools, all small white clapboard structures, by the end of the program, they're building one, two, and three story red brick structures. Um, this is the Dunbar School in Pulaski County, uh, Arkansas, otherwise known as Little Rock. Um, and if, the, if this Art Deco detailing looks familiar, it's because the architect of the Dunbar School was the same architect as Little Rock Central High School. Now, most of these schools were too small to be used for educational purposes. And so very few of them are still in use for educational purposes today. Of the 105 schools that I went to, only five are still in use for educational purposes. So that means that to have preserved these schools, they had to have um, been adaptively reused. These are the Pleasant Hill Quilters. At, uh, in Cass County, Texas, three of these women went to Rosenwald School. Three of them had parents who went to Rosenwald School schools. And the woman in the front row in the center, LaJoyce Flanagan, was a teacher in this school, the Pleasant Hill School. These women uh, found their school in great dis. Uh, their, this school had had gone gone into great distress, and these women sold quilts to raise the money to restore the Pleasant Hill School and turn it into the community center that it is today. And they meet on most Mondays in the schoolhouse to quilt. Uh, some of these schools have been converted into church halls. Uh, this is the Denby School in uh, Warwick County, Virginia. Some of them are museums, the Warfield School in Montgomery County, Tennessee. You see there are the reflection from the, um, uh, the, the, the light from these nine over nine pane windows that are such an iconic element of Rosenwald School's architecture. But many of these schools remain unrestored uh, and are at risk of collapse. This is the Hannah School in Newberry County, South Carolina that stands across the street from the Hannah AME Church and the church uh, uh, graveyard has grown up around the school. It's so important that, that there is a, an inherent plea for historic preservation in this work as um, these are the centers of, of history and memory in our community. And this is what happens the W.E.B. Du Bois School in Wake County, uh, North Carolina that had collapsed just before I got there. Uh, I'm going to just close on this, um, on this image just uh, to tell you uh, the story of how impactful these schools had been um, on the communities that they that they serve. These are brothers Frank and Charles Brinkley inside the K Rose School uh, in Sumner County, Tennessee. The photograph of Julius Rosenwald that hangs on the wall has hung in the schoolhouse since it opened in 1923. Frank Brinkley and Charles Brinkley both attended this school. They both went to college. They both went to graduate school. They both went on to become educators. Frank was a high school uh, math and science teacher. Charles was a middle school principal. They have four sisters. All of them came through this schoolhouse. 
And of those ten, sub, those uh, six siblings, they all had they had ten children. All ten children went to college. Without this schoolhouse, that legacy may not have happened. So with that, let me, um, I will stop sharing my screen and uh, welcome Ted back to the conversation. And um, I look forward to talking to you further about this history and legacy. Andrew, Andrew let me uh, bring this up to the present because um, you've done some very uh, fascinating uh, historical work here and your images I think are very compelling. Uh, could you talk just a bit about um, what made these schools so powerful? Um, apart from the fact that there were over 4,000 of them, uh, it appears from what you're saying that they also served wider community purposes, that they were located in places uh, that people could walk to, uh, that they were often centers uh, of a neighborhood. And I'll just say, from a, a personal perspective, a number of years ago when um, I was uh, thinking about uh, finding a place somewhere uh, in, in the Southeast to uh, have a second home, uh, there were preservationists in North Carolina who were overseeing uh, the disposition and restoration of a number of these Rosenwald properties. And one of the first thing I realized was that uh, they're so centrally located um, and so convenient that they really serve purposes beyond simply teaching the three R's. Could you talk a bit about the culture that surrounded uh, these facilities? So I think that the, the, I'll, tell, I'll answer your question. It's a good question. I'll answer by telling you this story. Um, one of the schools portrayed in my book that is still an active school is the Plaisance School in St. Landry Par Parish, Louisiana. Uh, and I went to when I, I had been to that schoolhouse, and it's 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 one of those. It was added onto in the 1960s, and so it's it remains an active school. And I decided that that I had to be there very early in the morning because of the way the light worked in this particular location. And so I figured I'm going to be out in front of an elementary school at 7 a.m. I better tell somebody I'm coming. Uh, and so I had called the principal in advance and told her I was coming. And then after I had done my photographs, I went in and introduced myself and she knew a lot about this school. The schoolhouse was built in 1920. 70% of the money came from the black community. A black community that was already being taxed to pay for white schools. And she marvels at this commitment to education, this passion for education in the African-American community. And she says to me, marveling at this commitment, they worked and they strove and they did what they could to make a better life for their children because in their eyes, education was truly liberation. And I took the title of this book, A Better Life from their, for Their Children from that quote and that conversation because I think it embodies uh, this uh, commitment that the African, the, the understanding that the African-American community inherently had that education was the access point to the American dream. You know, um, in the uh, post-FEMA, uh, post-COVID studies that uh, we did for FEMA, one of the things uh, that became obvious is that uh, these kinds of centrally located facilities and schools in particular, because the school building is, is a trusted place within uh, uh, most of our communities, uh, that the school needs to go beyond uh, traditional education, that it needs to become uh, involved with the distribution of health education, um, often with the uh, distribution of uh, information about uh, food awareness and uh, services for seniors and the like. Uh, could you talk a little bit about um, how the Rosenwald schools uh, might be a model for uh, bringing together a range of community services um, that uh, end up ultimately empowering the communities that they serve. So I think there's there's two particular things that I would comment on about that. So first of all, as I mentioned, the, the, the design of the Rosenwald schools from the beginning was that they were to be multi-use facilities, that they were to be used for educational purposes during education hours, but that they would be community centers after education hours. And there's, uh, and I, of course, of the course the time of my doing this work, I met former students and former teachers and historians and preservationists. And I heard all of these extraordinary stories of 
the community coming together in these schoolhouses with performances, uh, opera, operettas, uh, political events, that, the, that, these, that these did serve a broader audience. The other thing is this, that not only did the African-American community have to uh, contribute to the construction of this school, these schools, but they often had to then dig deeper to fund things like school supplies. And so what these schoolhouses represented uh, was not only the, an, a place for the community to gather, but an institution around which the community had to come together to support its, uh, its mission on an ongoing basis. You know, we're going to be looking at uh, some significant infrastructure investments over the next few years um, in uh, both urban and rural communities. And those infrastructure investments uh, could conceivably involve both new construction and uh, renovations. Uh, the uh, rehab of uh, any of a variety of, of facilities into true community centers. And I think uh, particularly because I see that um, some of our participants here are from Memphis, um, I think of uh, what the um, uh, community in Memphis did uh, to take a former Sears building, ironically, uh, and to convert it into a multi-use facility that has uh, corporate health offices and uh, learning spaces for children. There's a school that's cited in the renovation um, of that crosstown facility. Um, and the community was heavily involved, as I understand things, in bringing about that kind of renovation of an old Sears building. Um, and so the question that I uh, ask from a designer's perspective is, um, how do we program uh, both new and renovated facilities in a way that they reach beyond the traditional conceptualization of a school as only being a place for K to 12 kids um, into something that really uh, serves and empowers the communities and the neighborhoods uh, that surround the school? Yeah, I mean, I think that, so I mean, I'll, I'll turn this back to you. I think that these are important questions. I mean, if, if one of the elements of this program was, a, and this is progressive era, right? Progressive era architecture in service to education. Um, what role do you see architecture and design playing uh, in the schoolhouses of the future and in the schoolhouses we need to be building today? Uh, you know, uh, some of what we came upon uh, in our studies uh, was that um, school facilities uh, can combine a number of, of activities. They can become uh, drops for Amazon, for example, distribution points uh, for FedEx. They can uh, replace the traditional uh, uh, mail uh, room with uh, the kind of hotspots that enable people to communicate, and it's uh, particularly interesting to me um, that the Rosenwald schools were uh, funded initially by private sector money by a philanthropist who uh, had an understanding of the needs of, um, of the African American community. And if we're talking about communications and services, one has to wonder whether uh, some of our major communications companies today uh, might not direct through their philanthropic efforts uh, funds into supporting uh, communities of color uh, in developing these kinds of comprehensive neighborhood facilities. What is, what is your understanding of why Rosenwald decided to make this commitment and what his relationship was uh, with Booker T. Washington? So Booker T. Washington, uh, so Julius Rosenwald's um, um, was motivated by his Judaism. He saw America as a safe haven from anti-Semitism, and he saw that safe haven weakened by how America treated its African-American citizens. And he says, I believe in America, but I do not see how America can go forward if part of her people are left behind. And when he meets Booker T. Washington in 1911, Booker T. Washington invites him to come down, invites him to join the board of Tuskegee. And he goes down to Tuskegee in 1911, um, likes what he sees, agrees to go on the board of Tuskegee. But the two men develop this intense friendship and they start saying, what can we do together? And there's this great um, letter correspondence 
um, that in 1912 morphs into what becomes the Rosenwald Schools program. And it's important to remember, this is one of the earliest collaborations between Jews and African-Americans in the cause of what becomes known as There is a direct connection between the friendship and the collaboration and partnership of Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who marches arm in arm with Dr. King with his white beard flowing, and who famously says when he marches with Dr. King, he felt like his feet were praying. And what happened in Georgia earlier this year and this is not a political statement. This is a, a political fact that John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock crisscrossed the state together for two months in the runoff, clearly developing not just a political alliance, but a very close personal friendship. That relationship between John Ossoff and, John, and Georgia sends its first Jewish member to the United States Senate, its first African American to the United States Senate, that relationship and friendship between John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock stands on the shoulders of the friendship and relationship of Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington. I'm teaching a course this semester with uh, uh, a, a Jewish faculty member here at Northeastern on the uh, rise and fall of uh, Black Jewish relations uh, in this country um, mm -hmm. over the past uh, century or so. Um, and it's uh, always been particularly interesting to me that um, going back at least a century and a half, there um, have been um, uh, strong connections that have been, been built between the two communities. You raise one other interesting question here about how school leaders can work closely uh, with uh, local philanthropies, um, particularly in this time of rising stock prices where uh, donations to uh, educational uh, institutions um, uh, really could be made at a substantial level uh, to leverage the federal dollars. Uh, you raise an interesting question about how one goes about uh, making the connections uh, between communities where there have been affinities, uh, where there are clearly understandings of the nature of hate crimes um, and the need for education, and how we go about operationalizing uh, the ideas we have uh, towards uh, improving the quality of education and the educational outcomes uh, that uh, we would want to see in communities of color generally, but in Atlanta in particular, which has such a diverse and uh, civically committed population. Yeah, I, I think there's an historical context here that's, that's important. Um, education has been the backbone of the American dream since before there was the United States of America. The first taxpayer funded school in America dates to 1644 in Dedham, Massachusetts. That's more than 375 years ago. That's how far back our commitment to public education goes in this country. And there's a direct connection between that, the Land Grant College Act, which creates colleges all across America. That's passes in 1862. Historically black colleges, uh, uh, created largely in the decades after the Civil War, the Rosenwald schools of the 1910s and 1920s, the educational provisions of the GI Bill transform America from relatively poor to relatively prosperous. Brown versus Board of Education is one of the high watermarks of um, the civil rights movement. And what are we talking about today, right? Crushing levels of college debt, college affordability, um, uh, the context here is that we have a more than 375 year narrative arc in which we understand that education provides the on-ramp to the American middle class. And we have to think about that as an historical foundation, a pillar of American culture that has to be preserved and protected. And if, that, if we use that as our guide, I think that that becomes the North Star for the reform programs that you're talking about. You know, one of the uh, comments that has come in in the chat is around how we go about um, uh, building uh, community facilities, uh, particularly in urban areas where um, a large part of the population we want to reach lives in housing developments. Um, and my answer to that is that one of the things we've learned in COVID um, is that housing developments actually can become centers 
mm -hmm. uh, of community building. Um, every housing development, I grew up uh, in a housing development in East Harlem, every housing development has a community within it. Um, that uh, internal community is not necessarily always represented by the tenants association as such. Uh, sometimes it's represented uh, within the uh, faith community that serves the development. Sometimes it's centered on the youth activities. But one of the things we've learned under COVID is that uh, centering outreach and community building within public housing developments um, leads to the development of hotspots. Um, it uh, improves communication systems. Uh, there are places within developments where um, it becomes easier to do certain types of online teaching than it might have been in a traditional school. Um, and so housing developments, whether they are uh, in a city or in a more rural area, very often uh, can serve as the basis of a center that brings people together around education, job training, um, uh, economic development, uh, support for local entrepreneurs and the like. Um, and it seems that the Rosenwald schools in their way, uh, particularly uh, when you look at the people who graduated from them and the kind of civic leadership they've provided, the Rosenwald schools were certainly one way of bringing people together when they were young with multiple generations in a way that uh, enhanced community building. Yeah, I'll just simply respond to that by saying that, because I know our time is up here, um, that yes, the, the, the fundamental framework of the Rosenwald Schools program was built on community engagement, community partnership, public-private partnership, uh, and I think that those pillars today um, can all be deployed uh, in, the, in the cause of um, improving our schools. Um, Dr. Uh, Landsmark, a pleasure to join you. Selma, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Andrew and, and Ted, and for this really insightful uh, and incredible historical context that sets the stage for the rest of our programming. Um, let's have a look at the last poll that you all just took and see what the results are showing us. Um, and it's quite apparent here that most of our attendees feel that it's very important to think of the school and its neighborhood as an integral ecosystem, which is primarily what we've been talking about. Um, and before we move into our, our next session, which is going to discuss a little bit more on the how, let's take a look at another question, our third question for today. Do you agree typically students and especially students of color in underserved neighborhoods don't get the opportunities that students in affluent neighborhoods do. Feel free to make your selection from the choices below and we'll revisit them again later. Now, it's time for our first panel, Reimagining Infrastructure to Support Neighborhoods and Schools. How can a community come together to build infrastructure that supports students and res residents of all ages in accessing opportunities to learn, work, and connect with each other. Please help me welcome the panelists who are going to help us answer this question. First, we have Ryan Gravel. Ryan is an urban thinker, designer, author, and builder, best known for his master's theses and early work that launched the Atlanta Beltline, one of my favorites. His work centers on strategies for change that advance a broad, inclusive vision of communities. He was the lead creator of the Atlanta City Design, designing the city's inevitable changes so that it grows into a better version of itself. Next is Dr. Tawhida Baker-Jones. Dr. Baker-Jones is the first ever Chief Equity and Social Justice Officer for Atlanta Public Schools. Dr. Baker-Jones has spent the past 19 years working to ensure that we provide an excellent, equitable, and inclusive learning environment for every child in every classroom every day. She has served in diverse leadership roles across the K-12 spectrum, within the district, charter, and the nonprofit sectors. And finally, we have Josh Elder, the Director of Grants Management at Siegel Family Endowment which explores the impact of technology on society across learning, infrastructure, and workforce. Josh was previously Director of Strategic Initiatives for CS for All, 
where he led efforts to build the capacity of school districts and other education agencies to provide computer science education to all students. And we're welcoming Ron Bogle back to the stage as our panel host. Ron, it's all yours. I think a lot of inspiration can come to us from the work that was done on the Rosenwald schools. Um, let's see, do I see my panel yet? I don't know if I do, there you are, okay. Greetings all. So I'd like to tee up our conversation just a little bit, um, put plant some flags around some issues that we are looking at at Reimagine America Schools. Um, Kumar Garj, who works at Schmidt Future, uh, engaged Reimagine America Schools. And from his point of view, we need to leverage every opportunity, every resource, every asset available to uh, in, improve our public schools. And it was his concern that the historic amounts of money that was being spent on school construction, about $50 billion a year, really wasn't being leveraged to support uh, uh, new strategies for learning and, and teaching. And so our focus has really been on addressing uh, contemporary opportunities uh, when a community has funds to spend on a school facility. And what we're up against is a fact that most of the schools that are built today are still built on a 1950s model, uh, hallways and classrooms, where uh, a certain group of students had to be a certain place at a certain time to hear a certain topic. It's a passive approach uh, and it ignores in some ways uh, the, the, the opportunities that technology provides to have uh, a spectrum of opportunities and places to learn rather than a singular classroom space. And so uh, one of the issues that we were looking at with Reimagine American Schools is helping introduce school districts to new ways of thinking about what the learning environment might look like. We also have been advocating and supporting the idea of active learning, uh, hands-on learning, uh, maker space, um, uh, you know, technology space and so forth. And then the second, that, so that's an asset that really is being under leveraged uh, when we think about the future of public education. A second asset, which brings us to the education centered neighborhood reinvestment. The second asset is the neighborhood in which the school, school resides. Um, a unified strategy that really looks at that as an entire ecosystem rather than separate pieces. Now, we're not advocating that mayors should take over school boards. We've done that, we've been there. We don't need to spend time on that, but we are looking at how do you create new ways of collaborating? How do you create new strategies for crossing uh, 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 between agencies that normally are separated by silos? And so this panel I think is especially well suited to talk about change. Each of them bring a unique perspective in terms of the change that they have been dealing with and the strategies that they have used. Josh, since you are a co-presenter with Siegel today and uh, a funder for Reimagine America Schools, I'd kind of like to start with you. Uh, just to kind of set the table for uh, Siegel's interest in um, this subject matter and, and specifically, uh, why are we in Atlanta today? Yeah, thanks, John. Thanks so much for having me here. I'm really excited to also hear from other panelists and have been enjoying the chat uh, as well. Um, but uh, hi, everyone. Joshua Elder. I'm at uh, Siegel Family Endowment. And so we are a foundation that's based here in New York City. And I'll explain more about our interest in Atlanta. But our mission at Siegel Family Endowment is really to a very broad mandate and something that we strive to do is understanding and kind of shaping the impact of technology on society. And by doing that kind of believing in this world in which we that all people kind of have the tools, skills and context necessary to engage meaningfully in a rapidly changing society. And so we have been historically supporting organizations kind of at the intersection of three of our portfolio areas, uh, learning infrastructure and workforce. 
And I know at the top of the call today, Ron, you mentioned kind of Siegel family's view on infrastructure uh, and some work that we did in 2020 around infrastructure. And I'm sure all of us, uh, some people are probably loving it more than others, but have heard a lot about infrastructure and what isn't isn't infrastructure uh, and the fight in Washington. But our view on infrastructure is that we had believed or we believe that infrastructure really influences kind of everything in society. And for us, we think about if we're trying to solve some of the country's most pressing challenges, whether we're dealing with like inequalities in wealth, racial justice, climate change, education, there really has to be this new framework for looking at infrastructure and taking what we have kind of coined as this multidimensional view on infrastructure, looking at the intersections of physical infrastructure, which you mentioned a little bit, the, the role of digital infrastructure and the role of social infrastructure, really thinking about communities um, and family engagement there. And so we had put out a white paper last year that really talked about what multidimensional infrastructure looks like. And I'll make sure we get that link in the chat for people. But this year, as we started thinking about what specifically multidimensional infrastructure would look like and how that kind of intersects with the opportunity around education, started thinking about how could we move into the world of reimagining what education and learning could look like through the lens of physical, digital, and social infrastructure. And so as everyone probably had these conversations in the wake of COVID last year and even going through the pandemic still this year, I think our executive director, Katie Knight, kind of put it best. And, and when she was talking about the pandemic, she kind of talked about the pandemic and its impact on learning really should be a wake up call for all of us. And, and thinking about like, we know that this current system doesn't educate all students equally. It wasn't designed to do that. And it is not adequately equipping young people to succeed academically or professionally. And so how can we kind of take this moment an opportunity to really critically reassess and reprioritize today's education system. And so we've started having conversations with Ron and others to just think about through this multidimensional infrastructure framework, how can we strategically and comprehensively start investing in organizations that are reimagining what's possible and building the education infrastructure that equally and equitably serves all students. And so that kind of brings us to Atlanta, where we had been supporting some efforts uh, in a partnership uh, with the Georgia Tech Constellation Center on Equity and Computing and Atlanta Public Schools, really thinking about providing equitable access to computer science education, since that's one of our critical components of our education portfolio, but really excited to build off of that and, and think about how can we support communities and ecosystems in the greater metro Atlanta area to really start thinking about what this multidimensional view on reimagining what an equitable um, uh, education system looks like. And so just really excited to, to hear what others have to say and really excited for the follow-up in terms of taking all the great things that we discussed today and really turning them into action uh, in hopes of serving students and families better. Thanks, Josh. Dr. Baker Jones, I love your bio and I love the kind of passion you have about the work that you're doing and your approach to change. I would just say that earlier in my life, I was president of the school board in Oklahoma City and I learned how the sausage got made. Uh, public agencies and organizations, public schools, they're very change resistant. And, uh, and so introducing change in that environment is tough. But I think we've all come to the sort of acceptance that we can't let that stop us. We still need to plow ahead. Let's talk a little bit about your leadership at APS. And by the way, I was pleased to see so many of your colleagues and school board members with us today. But let's talk a little bit about how you're approaching your work in Atlanta and what strategies you're bringing to your work uh, that have helped you uh, move the change needle. <clears throat> Yeah, well, also, I want to thank you, Ron and City Age for also inviting me to speak here today on this much needed and very important topic. Um, and so my approach ties into the theme and the foundation of our discussion today is because we are working to undo centuries of systems and structures that none of us created, that we all inherited and were born into, but have a responsibility to, um, to address and adjust if we're going to see a better future for our children. And so that's the way in which I 
I into the work and I um, and I frame the work. Um, and so from the seat in which I sit in, I work to ensure that the school district enacts a theory of change that is grounded in that. Um, and in a way that ensures that all of its organizational systems, operational, talent, uh, stakeholder engagement are aligned to that purpose. Is how do we as systems leaders design systems and structures that improve access and opportunity for our students in everything that we do? Um, and I frequently tell my team that as systems leaders, our job is to go harder on systems and softer on people. I feel like a lot of time when people approach equity work, they approach it from the people level, looking at how we interact in our interpersonal relationships, developing cultural competence, <laughs> implicit bias trainings. And while all of that work is important, we know that we are all products of the systems we were born into, and we're all imperfectly perfect. We're human beings. And so no matter how much we try, we're going to have to spend every day working to be better versions of ourselves. So how do we then design systems and structures? that allow us to um, be deliberate in our decision making and reflective. So then that way, when our values aren't aligning to our actions, it comes to light for us. And what types of tools and protocols can we put in place to allow our systems leaders to pause in their decision maker and making to allow themselves that grace to engage in decision making in that way. And because we're approaching equity work from that lens and in that way, we are able to build coalitions across lines of difference. And we're able to bring people along who might otherwise be hesitant or resistant or even apprehensive about the work. And for me, it's vitally important to approach the work that way because this work is so human centered. Um, and because at the end of the day, people need grace to grow and we need to recognize that. And people don't fear change, Ron, they fear loss. And so getting and understanding what that loss means for them and meeting them where they are, not where you want them to be, is important for you to do this work in a humanistic way and in a way that respects the humanity of the folks that you're trying to bring along on this collective journey toward equity. Wow, thank you for that. Um, meanwhile, over in another part of town, Ryan has been reinventing all sorts of stuff in Atlanta and has been a leading voice uh, far beyond Atlanta in terms of thinking about the future of cities and how we need to address change. Um, I think most of us would agree that our cities are reaching a point where sustainability is in doubt and change is necessary. And I, I really look to you, Ryan, to draw from your experience to help us see any techniques or strategies or tools that you've worked with or that you've used that you find most effective in bringing folks along with a new vision. Sure, well, thank you again, Ron, for inviting me to be here today and sharing some perspective. Um, I really um, like what Dr. Baker Jones was just saying and the sort of focus on structures because um, we can all have the best of intentions, but because we operate within that structure, we're limited in, in what we can actually accomplish. And we really need to uh, repair, renovate, restructure those things in order to move, really move forward in a, in, the, in a way commensurate with the challenges that we're facing. And my, my work is focused on infrastructure, which is exactly that, literally the physical infrastructure of the city and its role in shaping our lives. Um, in college, I fell in love with infrastructure and with cities uh, after a year abroad in college. I, I grew up here in Metro Atlanta, basically stuck in traffic driving to the mall. And I spent a year in Paris where <clears throat> within the first month of being there, I had, I had lost 15 pounds. I was, I was in the best shape of my life because I was walking everywhere and eating fresh food. And the, I saw very clearly the role of the infrastructure of the city, the physical city, and my own personal health and well being. And I got home and I lived with my parents that summer and I took a job where I had to drive across the top end of 285, our perimeter highway every day. Suddenly that infrastructure was a barrier between me and the life that I wanted to live. And so that you really, when you start to see the physical city and the, and the systems and literal structures of the city as enabling uh, opportunities, creating opportunities for some people and not others, creating barriers for some people, um, that's where um, my work is sort of focused, centered. Um, city building is really complex. Um, you know, you need all kinds of different perspectives. And so um, 
the education uh, perspective uh, uh, is not my area of expertise, but it's certainly something that overlaps with a lot of other um, areas from business in innovation to um, health, public health, um, green space, climate, you know, all kinds of other things. And my job, as I have assigned myself, is to kind of be a dot connector between things and get people to see a shared vision for, for ourselves and, and something that's inspiring enough to compel us to action so that we do that hard work. Because in addition to having different areas of expertise, we're also talking about multiple jurisdictions and across departments and other agencies who have different kinds of um, things that they do and different perspectives and different, um, uh, you know, they don't, they don't always work together. And so in order to do that, we have to get everybody seeing that shared vision. And so that's where my work is sort of centered. So in the last 18 months, we've convened a lot of groups, educators, technologists, planners, architects, um, to explore all, all of these different issues. And one of the issues that kept emerging in our conversations was the issue of trust, especially around the race and equity kinds of, of challenges that we're trying to deal with. Um, the, the suspicion of what ulterior motives might be or uh, uncertainty about where a process might be going, uh, Dr. Baker Jones, how have you dealt with the issue of creating a, a trust that helps the process be an authentic and genuine process. Yeah, so equity work moves at the speed of trust. So you can't engage in this work until you have that a certain foundational level of trust to move the work forward successfully. Um, and you can't do equity work unless you're involving those who are most proximate to the problem in the decision-making process. So that's one way in which um, we go about in our work, or at least holding our leaders and going accountable about their work in, in, in doing the work from that lens. So then that way you can overcome that apprehension that folks may have about where you're trying to go and where you're trying to take them. If they have a hand in that process and you're co-creating and co-constructing what that decision-making would look like and what that outcome is going to be, then people are less skeptical of your motives. They're less skeptical of your objectives because they were involved from the ground uh, up um, versus the top down. And I feel like a lot of apprehension comes in because we do it the reverse. We make the decisions. We say we feel what we know what's best for people and communities instead of inviting the community into authentic conversation and dialogue about what their needs are. And then how do we work together to co-create the solutions and outcomes that they need to best meet their needs, if you will. And so you can't say you're doing equity work if you're doing it to people. This work has to be with people. It has to be involved, a collaborative and um and and and, and a collaborative and um and um uh, I, I'm trying to I'm like for a lack of a better word, it can't be a hierarchical process. It has to be a flat line process. The effort has to be done by us in efforts for us and in effort with us. Um, and if that doesn't happen in that way, you're gonna meet that resistance and that skepticism. So what is the uh, saying? If you're not doing it with me, you're not doing it for me. Oh, so, yes. I love that. I'm adopting that, Ron. <laughs> we have uh, five or six more minutes on our time. And rather than be probing with questions, what are the thoughts have you been bouncing around in your noggin that you want to share? Again, kind of looking at the how-to part of this. How do we overcome the compelling bureaucracies that we live in? I think just to build off of what Dr. Baker Jones uh, just said, for especially with being a funder in this world, and like I think I have to acknowledge the power dynamic that exists when you are a funder, um, and there's money on the line. I'd be naive not to like understand uh, and know that that's present. But I think for us in our work, and especially as we're thinking about why we have been uh, identify why we've been identifying Atlanta when we're based in New York City has been uh, exactly what Dr. Baker Jones was talking about, like understanding the landscape and having conversations. We don't have the answers at all. And we're not even the experts, uh, even in New York City. And so like actually 
trying to find organizations, trying to find people and understand like what the work looks like collaboratively, not just writing a check and giving money and say, okay, good luck. We hope to see the impact results in two or three years. But actually our big ethos is thinking about how do we co-learn and co-investigate and like roll up our sleeves and do the work together um, and know that it's going to be messy and it won't be perfect. I think that is something that a lot of funders try to do, um, but actually executing on that is really difficult because it does require a different mindset, capacity, um, but I think it is important if we truly want the work to be meaningful and sustainable and not just once off um, work that's happening, especially with the equity lens on that. Yeah, and in, in my work, I would just add that, um, you know, it's important to, in terms of understanding that landscape and engaging in this issue with the focus on schools and, and education, um, but looking at how that fits in the, into the the structures of the city um, and the, the relationship of the physical city to education and to the social cultural challenges and opportunities that students face today, just in the context of urban growth and development, the decisions and that mistrust that people have is well justified from uh, generations of uh, disinvestment of um, and, and pretty uh, harmful kind of growth policies. So whether you're talking about you know, the separation of kids from uh, in communities from their schools due to because the highways were plowed through their neighborhoods um, last century, or you're talking about the long distances between home and other resources due to our generation of investment and low density and car dependency, lack of access to uh, uh, resources, uh, the challenges that students and schools both face. Uh, but also the strain that their parents face and employment and healthcare and other stressors that are a direct result of the way that we've been building cities for generations and in the inequitable way that we've been building them. So the changing face of um, many families and communities uh, facing that are facing economic and cultural displacement associated with gentrification. I mean, both the loss and the perceived loss of that community, uh, but also the mounting challenges in those districts where where they where these kids end up if they do get displaced because those are, are places that are more often uh, spread out more traffic more dislocation declining market and economic conditions i mean the the physical city has an enormous impact on education and and people's lives and and if you can't talk about it and acknowledge it then well it's hard to move forward um and but also if you do talk about it then you've got entirely new constituencies of the people um, who are also interested and motivated to make changes in the way that we grow, the way that cities uh, manage themselves, the kinds of infrastructure we invest in. But we've got to connect the dots between those things so we get all those different constituencies working uh, in the same direction. And yeah, so for me, I would just add on to that and just uh, situate it in the seat that I sit in here in APS. Um, if you're thinking about equity change work in an ecosystem, right, you have to consider, at least in some of the things that I consider in my work, um, looking at the most recent census data, for example, the median household income for our white students here in Atlanta public schools is about $168,000 a year, the median while our African-American student median income is about $23,000 a year. That is a huge gap. And when we talk about the educational opportunities and resources available or that a family can provide for a child if they have 168,000 a year versus what a family can provide for their child at 23,000 a year, that we're talking about two vastly different realities. And so how do we as a school system stop in that, fill that gap? Especially when you consider about 75% of our students are live in low income, situations and research shows that a child in the city of Atlanta born into poverty has about a 96% chance of staying in poverty. And so although APS is going to do what it can do to own the part of that work that is ours to own, that context and that data suggests that APS cannot 
fix all of societal problems and that nor does APS even own all of the work to be done. So we are in this together. The success of our children is a collective responsibility. And we know when we look at the hierarchy of needs of students that food, clothing, shelter, those things that money provides you access to are foundational if students are going to be successful in school. And so one of the things we're currently working on in Atlanta Public Schools in conjunction with the chief equity officers of the Atlanta Beltline, the city of Atlanta, and Invest Atlanta um, with the support of the SHOP Foundation is to develop an opportunity index for civic business and um, philanthropic leaders in the community to use so that we can all track specific sets of measures that we know in the community impact student outcomes. So whether we're talking about access to early childhood or healthy food options or health care or safety, starting to track those measures so that we can begin to see our return on investments across our various organizations and that we can begin to make equity guided and data informed decisions about how we leverage our time, talent, and treasure in improving the quality of life in our communities and outcomes for our kids. And so for me, data is very important in doing this work because data allows for us to hold decision makers accountable. Um, data is also the preamble for reflection about like why are certain things happen because it illuminates that things are actually happening. It illuminates and substantiates that inequities are occurring. So it breaks the ground to your point Ron, earlier, Ron, about change. Like if data breaks the ground of you having to explain to folks that a phenomenon is occurring and instead focuses the conversation on solutions. So it's very important for us to have data and this opportunity index will allow us to do that um, because it also allows us to see if we're investing in changes actually occurring because we'll see the indicators go up. Um, and so I'm very excited about this. This is a really starting point for us to start to build collective action work because the responsibility is on everyone. Um, and it requires leadership from everyone. Every stakeholder plays a vital role in moving towards more equitable outcomes and better futures for our children. And um, this index is going to allow us to do our respective parts in making that happen. Okay. I just heard the dinger go off, which means our time is up. I can't imagine a better way to spend 30 minutes than with the three of you. Um, you've packed 10 pounds of sugar into a five pound bag, as my father used to say. But it's such great content and so much more to come on the program. So thank you, panel. And uh, Selma, we return the stage back to you. Thank you so much, panelists, for this incredible conversation on intentionality and purpose um, as we move the uh, program forward. If you're just joining us, you are watching Building a Complete American Neighborhood brought to you by City Age in partnership with Reimagine America Schools and the Siegel Family Endowment. You can register now for our second event in this national series focused on San Jose and Silicon Valley, which is happening on February 3rd. Our team will post the registration link in the event chat so that you can all join us again. Now, before we move on uh, to our next guests, let's look at the latest results from the last poll. Um, and it appears that most of us strongly agree or agree that typically students, um, especially from marginalized communities in underrepresented neighborhoods, don't get the opportunities that students in affluent neighborhoods do. Now, before we go into our final panel, um, we have one more question for you. The question is, typically cities and schools are organized in separate silos. Who is best placed to champion a coordinated approach? You've got five selections here to choose from that you see on your screen. Go ahead and make that choice. While you do that, we're gonna move the program right along onto our final part of the show. A panel discussion on schools at the center of community and lifelong learning. We're talking about new ideas and policies that help government and education leaders support students, as well as people of all ages, build new skills and increase chances of success in the workforce. Let me introduce you to our panelists. First up, we have Atiba Mbiwin, Executive Director of the Zayas Foundation, a philanthropic organization that serves disadvantaged children in human services, education, arts, and culture. 
He attended Brown University and graduated with a BA degree in economics and urban studies, including a semester at the University of Lagos in Nigeria. He dedicates much of his civic time to Bragg Dream Team, which is a statewide youth cycling program here in Georgia. Next up is Dr. Morsese J. Beasley. He is the superintendent of Clayton County Public Schools, where I attended school. He previously served as their chief school improvement officer and has over 20 years of dedicated service toward instructional practices. He's held numerous leadership positions in public education and is known as an innovative leader with an exceptional ability to transform both large urban and suburban school districts. And our final panelist is Monica Davis. She's the Chief Information Officer of DeKalb County School District, which has over 118,000 technology users. She also has industry experience providing technical support and technology related instructional design for businesses, both stateside and abroad. She has facilitated multiple sessions covering various educational technology topics with collaborative learning groups, such as the Explorers Guild, Tech and Learning, and the Learning Council. And finally, hosting our panel is Ann Wilson Kramer, a senior consultant with Cox Curry and Associates, providing strategic consultation to nonprofit clients in the critical areas of board development, volunteer engagement, corporate relations, and fundraising. Ann serves and has served on numerous local nonprofit boards, including the Alliance Theater Company, Community Foundation of Greater Atlanta, Georgia Partnership for Excellence in Education, WorkSource Atlanta, Public Broadcasting Atlanta, and currently she chairs the Georgia Foundation for Public Education, and that is just a few of the boards she sits on. And, and you could take it from here. The stage is all yours. Welcome, everybody. Oh, wow, Seema, thank you so much. And I will tell you before I give you this extraordinary panel, Ron, I mean, you, Josh, Tahita, and Ryan, you set this up perfectly. We are so grateful to you for the honest, bold, courageous conversation. And our chance today is to not be Pollyanna or naive, but to provide hope. The idea is that there are some extraordinary bright spots going on, not just in Atlanta, but in the surrounding region, because we have representatives with our superintendent, Dr. Beasley at Clayton County, which is south of the city of Atlanta. We have extraordinary Monica Davis, who's at DeKalb County, which is the east of the city of Atlanta. And then we have Darling Atiba Indawan, who is the head of our Zeiss Foundation and works primarily in the city of Atlanta and DeKalb County and Clayton County. So, the whole is represented. But as we start, and I think um, each of them will provide hope as well as challenges, barriers, and concerns. But at the end, we're gonna hear that the possibility is only possible when we have the collaboration among the public sector, the private sector, the nonprofit sector, and philanthropy. So you'll hear the stories from us. But as I love it, the concept here is schools at the center of community and lifelong learning. And you heard that lifelong learning. We started, we say preschool all the way through to post-secondary and certification for work, work and life. And we say that a strong school is central to building a complete neighborhood. And we're gonna to hear today some new ideas and policies that are helping the government and education leaders support students, as well as people of all ages in these neighborhoods, building new skills and creating new op economic opportunities. So they're gonna see how can these ideas live? What can be reimagined? What's gonna work? And I loved how Tahita talks about those basic level things, the foundational needs of housing, hunger, health, security. That is the 24 hour job of many of our government leaders. And yet the school receives the children and the family, no matter what has occurred at that foundational level. So today I'm going to ask these three amazing people to start up and just to sort of say, I would love for you all to share the specific examples that you are living as we speak, that you've seen that are working that a pro or the con. And Atiba, we will start with you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Ann. And I have to give a shout out to my colleague, Josh, who talked about being a funder and the power dynamic that involved there. So I just wanna say that um, I'm actually wearing my funder hat, 
but I'm all, and my parent had, because I have children and grandchildren who've gone to APS, Clayton County Schools and DeKalb County Schools. So I have a, a broader view than just as a funder. Um, but we have to recognize that philanthropy is not a solution, but it's a factor in helping public education do better. And our foundation, the Zeiss Foundation, actually funds nonprofits across the whole state of Georgia that serve children and youth in education, health, and arts. But we've been involved in place-based philanthropy in the Edgewood neighborhood of Atlanta for over 26 years. So we have this deep community-based experience. And we actually have a report that we published last year that we're gonna put in the chat for people who wanna look at that looks at this place-based philanthropy. And it all started with the school-based health center. The very first school-based health center in the state of Georgia was in Atlanta at Whiteford Elementary School in 1994. And then again, at the middle school level, Cohen Middle School in 1999. And it was our co-founder, Dr. George Brumley, who started it with Dr. Vita Johnson. And Dr. Vita Johnson, after 15 years, has started to replicate the school-based model around the state of Georgia. And now there are over 60 of them. And as we know from this pandemic, this can make a difference, right? Because the value proposition is that it's good for students, it's good for staff, for parents, and even employers. And again, we think about health in the broadest way. So it's not just physical health, it's the oral health, the dentist, vision, mental health, all these things we think are part of having a successful experience for students in public schools in Georgia. Oh, Ativa, thank you. And it's working. It becomes that first level of preparation for school and learning. So Monica, tell us a little bit about what's going on in DeKalb because you have some unique, different neighborhoods and probably one of the most diverse counties and school districts definitely in Georgia. And how are you all looking at this kind of play space, school in the center of the neighborhood? Well, I will say that the DeKalb County School District definitely has a rich history with a multitude of examples um, of community district collaboration. Um, as a large, a large school district, we have an entire division called the Division of Community Empowerment, Innovation and Partnerships. And the entire purpose of that division is to provide leadership and support in initiating, leveraging, facilitating these relationships um, amongst our communities, our schools, our divisions, and so on. So there are many examples I could share, but I wanna be a little bit selfish and focus on the one major responsibility that I as a chief information officer has, and that is digital equity. So I think by now, everybody on here knows that um, you don't have access to a device, and you don't have access to internet connectivity, um, that is going to impact student learning. So I think we all agree um, that that is the case. And like most districts, um, DeKalb um, is working to implement and manage that ongoing one-to-one -one access for our students both in the school building, but also to support learning beyond the school building at home. So this would be that digital divide that we always talk about. Mm -hmm. digital divide. And uh, with local, state, federal funding, we've been able to meet those needs. But our focus is not merely on the digital divide. Our focus is also on what are they going to do with this equipment once they get the equipment? And what does that empowered learning environment looks like to support innovative technology that encourage our students to be creative, um, active, knowledgeable, and, and really ethical participants in society, which is what a school district is responsible for producing. I think we all agree to that too. So when considering digital equity, e education um, has to definitely address um, the digital use divide for our students. And uh, we call them our digital dreamers. Um, that's our, our initiative for our students. And um, make sure we address their digital literacy and their digital um, um, digital literacy, as well as their citizenship, which are critical components um, mm -hmm. that they'll need when they're leaving it into the world. So um, that old African proverb that talks about the community and the engagement of the entire village to support the children, it still holds true. And so now we're just talking about a digital um, village and a digital environment. So as a school district, we are definitely working um, hard to engage with our parents and community. We, um, we start with strategic planning. In our district, um, the district's technology plan is made up of a cross-functional um, advisory committee. So we bring in parents, community leaders. Uh, we brought in colleges, our local colleges 
and uh, our businesses to help us determine how should technology be used to support this and this, you know, empowered, transformed learning environment that we're all trying to get to that's been talked about today. So you start with strategic planning, and that is one of the things that we definitely do. And this assists with that authenticity and relevancy of what we should be doing and what we are doing. So I look, someone said that before, if you're not doing it um, with me, you're not doing it for me. And so th that speaks directly to the strategic planning um, piece of it. But um, our Tech Cafe initiative that we have focuses mm -hmm. on families and communities yes. and leveraging um, exposure to digital learning, the digital learning environment. And part of the Tech Cafe, we, we show them how to use these tools so that parents are empowered um, to do what they need to do to support their students. Because if you don't understand the tools, you can't support your students in today's environment. So, but one of the challenges we had with the Tech Cafe was that all of our parents weren't attending. So about 20, I would say about 25% of our school district um, are English language learners. We speak mm -hmm. over 50 um, languages in our school district. And with that being the case, um, the language barrier definitely was creating some challenges for us. So we created a mobile impact hub, which is a bus outfitted with technology and internet connectivity and awesome, very super energized family engagement <laughs> um, liaisons who drive into our communities and they park that bus in the middle of our communities and bring our parents onto the bus and we get them registered for into the campus so they know how to check their grades and we get them, show them the learning management system and how they navigate in and out of it and what the students have available to them. And so um, this has made a huge difference um, and it's, it continues to make a huge difference for our school district. So um, our tech cafe was really brought to life when you talk about that um, community um, connectivity mm -hmm. and is allowing empowering our community to be able to give back. Once they learn what we have, now they're saying, hey, well, we can do this as well and um, bring these initiatives to the district as well. So that is what we're working really hard on um, from a digital equity and, and a digital equity. I love how you do, you've done not just both and, but a kind of a, a triple threat where you're engaging and uh, educating the young people to use their technology. You are, of course, connecting with the parents using the technology and also bringing the school into the community, literally, so that those who can um, take advantage of it, I love it. So it is all about collective and collaboration, working with all of your partners across the, the districts, but you have one of the highest percentage. I know I just heard your superintendent say yesterday, right Atiba, uh, Morsi, so we were all on the same call. Over 20% of your children are English, um, as a, as a second language. So we are so thrilled. And I think you, Dr. Beasley, come with so many stories with similar situations to what Monica has described and finding ways to link your schools into the communities in which you serve. Thank you, Ann, we do. Uh, of course, we border DeKalb County where Monica is. So we share students at times from one mm -hmm. day to the next, right? They. They go back and forth at times. But our, our work, of course, here in Clayton County is as they are in DeKalb in Atlanta, we are working to improve literacy, numeracy outcomes, working on social emotional learning. But Ann, I'll tell you and, and everyone, when I became superintendent about five years ago, I pulled together the, the chairman of the uh, board of commissioners and some other leaders. And I said, we've got to re-engineer this community. Uh, I can... Uh, support teachers working on reading. We can provide staff development, I said, but their outcomes are going to be compromised if we don't address the systems and structures that impact those outcomes. And so we, over the last several years, we have really focused on equity. We've really focused on systems and structures. And I'm so pleased to share that one area that we we're making progress in, we have a collaboration with developers here in Clayton County developing uh, housing communities, awesome. residential communities, uh, the Clayton County government, the housing authority, the economic development office. Uh, we have nonprofits such as Star C. We have TriStar, which is an investor for the developers. We have all of these individuals, entities at the table, and we are engineering communities with, with school resources right in the center of those communities. And so we're so excited that even uh, not too far from the airport, I guess it's a little far, but on Mount Zion, <laughs> there's a new development. And we have, uh, in the midst of this residential area, we'll have an after-school activity center. We'll have a learn early learning space. 
for families to continue that learning, not just uh, Monday through Friday, but even on the weekends. We'll have uh, housing committed to employees who would like to stay in the development, who could also provide the, uh, the leadership and the, and the tutoring, the support of students after the school day. It's one of the most exciting uh, initiatives that we have occurring in our school system. And I should share this. They wanted some uh, tax abatements. And we at the table, we said no tax abatements if children don't benefit short term and long term. And so they committed to providing over $1 million to our Clayton County Schools Foundation for student scholarships, in addition to creating this early learning center that will be accessible to every resident in this new development. Just a, a wonderful example of a collaboration that is going to benefit the community at large but specifically the families that are in this residential community. Oftentimes you hear people say affordable housing, they think of low income housing, but I want you to know that that is not accurate. Affordable housing, but housing that brings together the community, that brings together the schools, that brings together the governments, uh, an environment in which our students are actually engaged in not only literacy, but also engaged in civic responsibilities mm -hmm. as well. It's really a, a, a powerful example of what happens when superintendents, and you know, I tell people, I wish I could just focus on teaching reading only, but my job <laughs> is not just about teaching reading. I've got to help address all of those barriers that contribute to the lack of access. And Oftentimes we hear about the achievement gap. It's really not an achievement gap. It's an opportunity gap. So we are working to create opportunities. And I'll share this, Anne, in addition to that amazing initiative and development that's occurring, our Board of Education has committed to opening up early learning centers throughout our county. We have about 1,000 kids right now in pre-K. We know long-term our outcomes are directly impacted by the number of percent of kids in pre-K. So over the next several years, we'll have up to 4,000 seats for pre-K in our school system and about six early learning centers. Listen to this, listen to this. They will be staffed with primary care physicians, dentists, ophthalmologists. They'll have WIC uh, programs. They will have whatever our kids need in order to thrive and learn and to continue that learning well beyond pre-K, well beyond K-12. So just examples, and I'll tell you this, I am right now recruiting partners who want to <laughs> plug into those early learning centers. So a little advertisement right here, appealing partners who want to plug into those early learning centers and we continue our work as our county is really growing uh, in the mm -hmm. number of citizens residents. So we are working very closely with the government. We know where the developments are. We're at the table. We are negotiating, creating memorandums of agreement, understanding to ensure that the children yes. are at the center of those developments. We don't want to stop anybody from making money. But while they're making money, we want to ensure that our children are educated and that they are literate enough so that they can one day make the same money that others are making. So just a few ideas. Okay, so, amen. <laughs> so, I, mean, I, know, I know this is so fun. See, there is hope. There is hope. It lives. And I'm, as I know, Atiba's, it's interesting, his journey of getting to that holistic, which is early learning, um, housing, health. And, oh, education. But I'd love, before I, I go to Ativa and Monica, just give us a hint. I always say more C's. What, Dr. Beasley, Superintendent Beasley, how did you do it? You said you call the chairman, and sometimes that always doesn't yield the kind of result that you had. Because, I mean, like what Ryan says, you know, we all have our little silos and we all have our jobs to do. One of the things that Ativa and I have worked on was to realize that in order for a child to get to school, even those who live proximate to the neighborhood, they have to go through city streets and walk on sidewalks that are cracked or street lights that aren't working or go by condoms and syringes of the activities of the day before. And that's the city's responsibility or in your case, the county. So tell us you know, in a little bit about 
how you got this to happen, and then Atiba and Monica in terms of how you got the kind of results of the student student inc outcomes and community leaders. Tell us how you did it. Well, well Aunt, because, Aunt, I'm, but, gonna, I, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say because he's a charming person. That's pretty clear. Okay, <laughs> oh, now <laughs> I hope so. And I'll be very honest. The one thing I did share initially in my first year, I shared with everyone. I said, if you all think Dr. Beasley is going to come in here and change the outcomes in this in this community as a superhero, I said, I'm going to let you know, you will not see that occurring. I, that no one's going to come and save us, Dr. Beasley included. It takes a community-wide effort, a collaboration. And I mm -hmm. shared with them, if we have the highest mobility rates in the state, if we really want to improve our outcomes in this district, we've got to address the systems and structures that are contributing to those depressed, if you will, outcomes in our community. That mm -hmm. got their attention. And then, of course, they uh, having a little credibility as, as an educator, someone who has uh, ha had a degree of success in improving outcomes for children, that gives you credibility to at least for I guess people will at least listen to you. So they at least listened to me. But once they began to understand all the variables that were at play, some of them within our control, some of them not within our control, but some of those variables within their control or at least sphere of influence, they understood that we had to work together to improve these outcomes for all children. And it would not happen overnight. It would take time with very deliberate, intentional, decisions that intersect, if you will, government, home, school, work, et cetera. And fortunately, we've got a chairman and a delegation and a board. All of us seem to understand that. And we're working and moving in the right direction as a system, which I believe is, is producing some phenomenal outcomes with the data only needing time to catch up to what we're actually mm -hmm. doing. Well, you are certainly on that path, which we're so excited about. So excited and proud and grateful. So Atiba, talk about your journey and what it took and what you're still having to do. Yeah, and we have people from all over the country, even I think from Canada. I just wanna say real quickly about this Atlanta group you see here um, in Monica in DeKalb County. Um, in 1998, my family became homeless due to a fire in the apartment complex. Two years later, my daughter graduated from DeKalb County, Lithonia High School, went to Spelman and Georgia Tech and became a civil engineer. So what you're talking about technology is, is for real. Dr. Beasley, the reason why he's so successful is he's actually come up through schools in Georgia. And his experience on the ground, I've been to meetings with him, he's the real deal. He's the real deal. And Ann Kramer and I, seven years ago served on the governor's arts learning task force. And we went around the state to see schools that emphasize the arts. And I, I didn't hear anybody really talk about arts in the past hour, but I think again, it's one of the secrets to the success we mm -hmm. need in the 21st century, because this, this century is all about creativity, the innovation and arts is really where, where you started. And so I just wanna say, Two things. One is uh, um, the quote that's lived with me for a long time that goes back to the 19th century from <laughs> the wise man Mark Twain. He said, Don't <laughs> let your schooling interfere with your education. <laughs> and if you think about it, Andrew admitted he's a fifth generation Jewish Georgian who mm -hmm. never heard of the Rosenwald School until the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And he's an educated man. So, so we have to rethink education in this 21st century. And so I'm going to refer you to a study that was done in 2007 called Tough Choices, Tough Times. You got to read it because it's about creating a new schools for the 21st century. And I, I haven't met Dr. Baker Jones, but we need to talk because we have a school <laughs> in the Edgewood community that we want to bring back online and co-create it and redesign it. And we could use your help because we think we can take all this knowledge that's being shared today and create a model for the Atlanta area that others can learn from. You know, and Atiba, not only that, but that neighborhood is now the gentrifying neighborhood right. that um, has that best of both many long-term residents 
this is it's our neighborhood it's our yeah, contingent yeah. neighborhood but it's got so that would be uh, tahita or you're listening so this is exciting thank you so much monica what have been your challenges and your advice that you can give us to how did you get that your bus and your technology well um i will tell you this the, the first thing you have to do is you have to expand your vision so I will admit that um, as a CIO, I had to understand, and as an, I would say as an educational technologist, um, this is all I've ever done. And I had to understand that it's not all your responsibility. Um, and with that in IT, a lot of times we have a habit of holding it really close <laughs> to us and trying to make decisions that, you know, we really need to be working to empower others. I tell our staff, we just had a leadership meeting this morning, and I said, our job is to watch and to engage and determine how technology is used to do whatever it is that our students need to learn. And if, you are, if you're not talking about how technology is supporting learning, then you're speaking Greek to me. I have no idea what you're talking about. So they, all, they know, you know, when they come, this is how this is going to impact learning. This is how we're going to keep it running. This is, you know, so that I'm, we're training just from a very simplistic perspective, but from IT, we have to expand our vision. Um, like mm -hmm. I mentioned, back to the strategic planning, that was a big, big piece of it, making sure that our strategic plan wasn't 160 play, pages of blah, 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 which it had been, you know, in the past, but it was 20 pages of, you know, getting straight to what, I, what an empowered learning environment actually is and how we support it. So that was the first step. And then it was about empowering our, our partners, um, the various divisions, um, working with, you know, ensuring that our Board of Education made a, a, an investment many years ago um, for the devices. So we started in 2017 with our mm -hmm. Digital Dreamers Initiative. So we kind of had a head start when all of this started. We really were trying to fill in gaps. Um, so um, the Board of Education definitely made that um, that that jump, that leap then. But then moving forward, you know, our superintendent, uh, Mrs. Cheryl Watson Harris, as she came into um, to work with us and um, and coming to the district to lead us, you know, a lot of um, her expectations as it pertains to equity and and making mm -hmm. sure that the community is engaged and, and served um, was a, another large piece. And so we were able to bring in the community to say, where, where are the pain points? What, what would you need? What would be helpful? So that's literally what happened, just engaging the right people, expanding our vision, because we had what we needed. We had the two technology, we had a bus, <laughs> we, we had the partners. That, that's the easy part. The hard part is creating something that is relevant, that is authentic. Mm. So that, that is really where we went. I think our next steps as we move forward is to continue with our um, tech cafes, but not just to, teach, to provide awareness of our tools to our parents. We wanna look at facilitating the integration of, of how to use these tools so that our parents are able to provide feedback. I was reading where they were talking about um, parents being able to, to assist and provide, you know, um, feedback into their child's learning and what they think might be helpful as they work with the teachers and be a partner for teachers. So if we can prepare them in the digital, the digital literacy and their identity, the digital identity, they'll be able to help our teachers even more and partner to, um, to impact that um, learning environment for our students. So, you know, I could go on and on and um, I'm, a, I'm a talker, so I'm gonna start kind of cutting <laughs> but it But what I love, you're already doing, uh, the next question you answered was what's the next step? and what you've also discussed is that integration with the community, with the families and their own prosperity and their ability to stay, as you were talking about, Morsi, staying in your community and having that um, life experience all in that community in the neighborhood school being at the heart. I love it. So I'm going to talk to you, Morsi, what's next for you after you build this wonderful neighborhood? We've got more neighborhoods to build, and honestly, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a county, and we've got work to do. I, we're looking right now, and I, I, we have a, a new development occurring in the Forest Park um, area. Mm -hmm. Really, it's between Forest Park, Morrow, and maybe some unincorporated areas. Uh, we've got new residential development, um, high-rise developments, and they've already committed through, because of our conversation with them, they've committed to build a school for us. So, of course, that's another one. And I did, I mean, don't even have all the details worked out as of yet, but just having the right people at the table and for mm -hmm. them to commit to doing that, um, it, it's, it's progress. And so again, we're re-engineering this entire community. 
That's why we believe the mobility rate has gone down from 30% to 25%. Mm -hmm. Families mm -hmm. want to stay in Clayton County and mm -hmm. they're finding reasons to stay. And as a part of the, the, the collaboration, they're offering support to families when they have financial lows, if you will, so they can mm -hmm. stay in these residential areas. It all makes a difference. Uh, it, it's not about um, who, who should get and who should not get. It's about everyone understanding as a community, we have some things in common. We, we may have differences, but let's focus on what we have in common and let's create environments and spaces for all of our children to be successful. Mm. all of our children. And that's really what we're focused on. So I mentioned that development, but I am on the hunt. You know, I'm on the prowl and we're going to find <laughs> other developments. Developer, developers, philanthropists, anybody. But the question, and I'm going to go back to you, Atiba, about the what's next, but before at the next round to think about that full integration of work, accessibility and affordability including the education experience. So that's the next round. Atiba, the what's next? You sort of alluded to it when you were talking to Tahita. Yeah, no, I, I think again, we have an, a, we have an opportunity to actually uh, bring a school back online that was closed using all this information. And I, I just wanna again, highlight this uh, importance of the blended teaching and learning environment mm -hmm. that we're in because we weren't really preparing for this moment. And when it hit us, everybody got shook. And I think, again, we can design a, a school now, um, taking these best lessons as uh, Monica told us about integrating technology, but also addressing the pandemic's impact on so many children and even teachers. And so mm -hmm. being able to, to address, you know, the mental and emotional, social, behavioral issues that have surfaced is, is is really critical. And, and that's why, again, I, I wanted to lift up the arts because mm -hmm. what, we, what we learned during this time period is people to cope would sing, would dance, would draw, do murals, right? And so, and so I think, again, that's, that's what we have to incorporate into our schools in order to make it safe, healthy places for our children to learn and for teachers to, to be able to teach, you know? I love that. And I think one of the things we did learn in the academics, we have to continue to boost the and is the arts and then the exercise, a chance for kids to get outside and be able to walk and play, the play and the arts, the creative spirit, the energy. So I'm going to go back to you, Morsese, about affordability, accessibility, and how that can integrate with workforce and education. Well, well, Anne, I, I should share that when you really think about education, you think about families, right? Exactly. And we, we want families to really focus on education. So the less they have to be concerned about housing, the less they have to be concerned about uh, getting groceries or meeting those basic needs, then they can actualize. They can really focus in on education. And that's really our work, trying to ensure that the developers and the investors know that we, you know, you know, we're all capitalists here. We want you all to make money, <laughs> but we don't want you to make money at the expense of families not being able to maintain their residence and stay uh, in their uh, their homes or their apartments or their dwellings, if you will. We don't need a high homeless population. That's not going to help them, and it certainly won't help the school system. Uh, we need families who are stable. So children can learn and learn at high levels. And so I'm very, very pleased that they've been very open and understanding of that conversation. And they understand their responsibility. We all have a responsibility to create these neighbor, thriving neighborhoods and communities in which our children are safe, families are safe, they're learning, uh, they're, they're thriving in these spaces. And, and I'll close with this, Anne. We are also are working with an organization to create learning, learning um, opportunities, mathematical learning opportunities in our park spaces around the county. So families can go Ooh. there and basically they can work on mathematical skills. That's all a part of creating this culture, if you will, of education. But we do understand that 
it has to be supported by individuals who understand that all of us have a responsibility through our policies, through our systems, through our guidelines to create spaces for families to thrive, to have mm -hmm. good housing, to have whatever they need uh, to ensure that students can focus on their learning and actualize and, and achieve the potential that we know exists in all of our children. So if, and, and I'll tell this, I, I love hearing what Dr. Baker Jones shared about what she's doing in APS and we're watching her work right uh, you know, south of Atlanta. But equity is really not a culture war. And I'll close with this. It's not a culture war. It's really just good human beings figuring out what children and others need in order to be good human beings human being. in order to contribute. That's what it's all about. So don't 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 buy into the into the hype or the myth that it's a culture war. No, it's about it's enough for everybody on the planet. Let's figure out how we can live together in peace, which means we focus on our children because eventually, eventually, they are going to be the ones in charge of this planet in whatever shape we leave it in. <laughs> Woohoo! Yay, Dr. Beasley. Well, I think for all of us, the, the whole essence of building community and having schools within our communities and the integration of all of our public and our private, nonprofit and philanthropic sectors is what's gonna make it. And we care about each other. Yeah. And um, we promised that you would see hope, that you would understand there are frustrations, concerns, barriers, and structural con uh, constructs that are in the middle of what moving forward looks like. But what you have seen and heard from these amazing people, Dr. Borsese Beasley, Superintendent of Clayton County Schools, I love my Atiba Imbawan that we have known and been involved together for 100 years, maybe not 199, who is the head of our Zeiss <laughs> Foundation. And of course, you, darling Monica Davis, it's so fun for me as the IBM or to have a CIO on the call. Ha ha ha, I love it. And a CIO who is outside the room, outside the box, and available for the kids. So for each of you, thank you. But even more to those who are on this call, we say you have heard from the best, you have examples of hope, and we will live into the understanding of how com our communities and our schools can be redesigned for all. Thank you, Seema, we turn it back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much everyone for uh, an insightful, another insightful session. We're gonna move on to wrap up the show. But before we do that, we're gonna look at our final uh, poll results. And it's very clear that uh, most of our attendees as well as our panelists as they've been speaking um, that agree that this is gonna take a coordinated collaborative effort for cities and schools to organize together using mayors, philanthropy, education leaders and business leaders alike. And this wraps up our show. Thank you again for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed hearing from the visionary leaders that we had with us today. They are working to make Atlanta's neighborhoods complete by centering them around education. We hope you leave today with lessons on how we can build more equitable, dynamic, and livable neighborhoods in your city. And this is just the beginning of our work here in Atlanta. Thank you for helping us get started today and stay tuned for more. We wanna thank our guests and attendees, and of course our partners, Reimagine America Schools and the Siegel Family Endowment. We've been bringing City HTU virtually from the start of the pandemic, and we will continue to do so. We're also getting ready to have live events too soon. If you'd like to have a City Age episode produced around an idea or topic of your interest, please get in touch with us. Our mission is to bring leaders together who are building the future. Until next time, I'm Salma Shobaya. Stay well and stay connected. Thank you. <laughs>